morning. It's a, it's a blessing to be here. I'm most grateful to Brother Jason who just warned me that the cup here is a cup of poison for the flies. So I won't partake of, of that. <laughs> uh, for those of you that were, were here in October or listened to some of the presentations, you will remember a story and I'll share this again because it's very... That's important to me, and uh, you'll understand the significance that on the, the night that I proposed to my wife, I said to her, will you unite your gifts and talents with mine for the proclamation of the third angel's message? Very formal proposal, wasn't it? But uh, uh, the other, a few weeks a few months ago when we were talking about the events of 2014 and what would be uh, best for the proclamation of the third angel's message and cons- contemplating the period of time that I would need to spend away from home, uh, my wife said to me, I think you should go. I think you should go. So... I am very thankful to uh, my wife uh, for uh, letting me be here. And when I say letting me be here, of course, you can go, but there can be an emotional uh, response to that that is not so good, but I know that I have her full support, and so I'm standing in the gate praising my wife before you this morning. For she is a virtuous woman and her price is above rubies and I'm very, very grateful. So I bring uh, greetings from uh, Australia. Uh, I'd like to invite my brother Igor just to join me briefly. And we'll tell you another little story before I, I begin. Igor is uh, travelling with me from Australia and he is in the southern part of Australia and I'm in the northern part of Australia, and there was a, a camp meeting with uh, Nada and Imad in, Queen, in, in northern New South Wales, and I attended that camp meeting, and while I was there, all the brethren knelt together and prayed over me, sending me uh, on their behalf to, to meet with the brethren here, and the following week, there was a, a meeting in Victoria, and, and Nada and Imad were there, and they all knelt, and they prayed over uh, uh, Igor, sending him uh, and we, we all realized that this wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't orchestrated. It wasn't organized. So, uh, so uh, the Lord has, has uh, sent us and we pray that uh, we can be a blessing as you are a blessing to us. And uh, so I just wanted to ask you and I'm going to ask Randy to come up as well and just ask both of you gentlemen to pray for me before I begin speaking. I've just put Randy on the spot so he's a bit shaken. <laughs> and we will, uh, we will kneel together. We won't kneel in front of the pulpit. So. <laughs> oh, kind and wonderful creator. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come together on your holy and precious Sabbath day with like-minded individuals who want nothing more than to be with your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for the safe travels here. Bless the the homes that are left. Uh, Keep them safe. Uh, Guide us as we go back home. Uh, Bless each individual here. Uh, A special blessing on them. For we all gathered here for a particular reason. Um, Some for health, some for uh, their own individual reasons. Lord, bless each and every one. We ask these things in your holy and sacred name we pray. Amen. Amen. Father, it's a special time that we're here before you, and we really want to hear your voice, so we ask you to speak through our brother Adrian. Father, may we hear your Father's heart to us. May it be so clear in our minds, in our hearts, in our souls, in our spirits. Thank you, Father, for your thoughts towards us, which are so wonderful, for being all for us. 
And so empower our brother with your Holy Spirit and use him as a channel of blessing to your children, we ask in Yeshua's name. I'd also like to uh, thank all of the, the team at uh, Talking Rock Sabbath Chapel for uh, putting all this hard work into making this facility available for children of the King to come and, and worship together. So thank you very, very much uh, for that. I'm reminded of a number of times in my life where I would be traveling with my family and we would be traveling a long distance to go home. And uh, as a child, that distance was quite, quite tyrannical in how long it would take to get home. But I remember when we were living in, in one particular location, we lived on the edge of the desert down in northwestern Victoria, and as we were traveling home, and particularly when we travel home at night, out on the plains there was a radio tower which had a red light at the top, and it would, like a beacon, it would come out. I knew when I saw that red light on the beacon on the top of that radio tower, I knew that I wasn't far away from home. And, and, and the warm feelings would begin, and I would think about uh, getting home and being with my family and having something nice and warm to eat and, uh, and then being in my bed. The warm feelings. And I have many memories of being with my family and th those experiences of coming home. And I relay that story because uh, in many ways, when I was on the plane with Brother Igor and my son Michael, and I was traveling in this direction, I had that feeling of coming home. After what I'd experienced uh, last October, and the memories and the images uh, and the, the fellowship that I enjoyed was welling up in my spirit, and I was in anticipation of coming home. And... Uh, I guess the, uh, the, uh, the, there was a red beacon actually, where is it in, in, in uh, is it Tate, is it, the, there's, well, you're going up the hill and there's two big red lights and I remember that last time I came up these two big red flashing lights because we don't have a four way stop in Australia and we don't have big, when you see flashing red lights in Australia it means there's a big problem but uh, these two big flashing, I knew we're nearly home, we're nearly home and so it's uh, it's a tremendous uh, blessing to, to return. And I pray that during this time that uh, as children of the King, we are part of the family of God. We serve one Father and one Lord Jesus, that as His children, that we will uh, not only have transfer of information but that we will build memories together as a family, that we will take away with us the, the relationships, the experiences, and a sense that the Father's love is manifested not only through Christ, but through Christ, through each of us, towards each other. That's, that's my prayer. And uh, we have a number of days to do this. To, to be together and I'm, I'm very grateful for the, the program schedule that we will have time to uh, talk and fellowship and sing and, and pray together. Jesus is in this very room and uh, I pray that Christ in you will connect with Christ in me and that we will be joined together. Another experience of coming home, and this time it was to my grandfather's home, who is also my father, my father's father. And uh, 
This was after my grandfather had passed away. And uh, my grandmother was not far from passing away. On my father's side, my father is Dutch, so it's in Dutch, it's Opa and Oma rather than Grandma, Grandpa. And I felt the need to go to the home, knowing that my grandmother was soon to pass and that the property was going to be sold. And I knew that I would not be able to do this again like I was able to do now, to go to the house. And I would go into each room and I would just shut my eyes, each room in the house. And I would shut my eyes and the memories would begin, the faces, the laughter the beautiful food, the, the feeling of belonging as I sat. <laughs> the, the emotion is there, even when I think about it. So why would I feel like that? It's just a house. It was dusty, spider webs. But I, I, I felt the need to go through, through each room and as I sat in there and I would just remember... And then I, I realized at the end of this process what a privileged person I am to be able to have something like this, to have those memories, to have a sense of belonging to a group of people, my blood, my flesh, that I could call this place home. And then I also realized that this house was the one place in my life that had never changed. My grandparents from the, the day that I was born until the day that they died, that was the house that they lived in. And often we would go on our holidays, we would always go to their home. Uh, when we were in that, that uh, vicinity, we would always visit there and my aunties and my uncles would come and we would get together and we would laugh and uh, there were other things, of course, that would happen when all the cousins would be lined up against the wall and who was the tallest and who'd grown the most and some not so good things, but uh, especially if you weren't the tallest. But, but there's a thread of memories that I experienced through this where there was a sense of belonging. For I was in my father's house. I was part of the family. And I had a sense of belonging. And I treasure this. And... Just as there is this house, which wasn't actually the house that I was living in day by day, but it was a house that was central to my life. It was my grandfather's house. And in heaven, well, even though we dwell in homes here, our home is in heaven. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And our, the center of our joy, the center of our hope, the stories that we live by, the story of our history is written in the Word of God. That God sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, it's something that I know that you are familiar with. Where our elder brother, the Lord Jesus speaks in John 14 and verse 2. Now, I'm reading here, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, I like, I actually prefer some of the other translations because when I get to heaven, I don't want my own mansion. I want to live in my Father's house. I want to be where my Father is. I want to be where Jesus is. And so, if you read some other translations, uh, one of the, the, the New Living translations says, there is more than enough room in my Father's house. In my Father's house are many rooms for His children. And I like to, I like to think of it uh, in that context. In our Father's house 
are many rooms. And what is occurring in heaven? If we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, if we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, then what takes place in heaven should manifest itself on earth. The family should manifest if we are seated in heavenly places in in Christ Jesus. So what does it mean to be in the Father's house? It's It's a simple question, but one that needs to be asked. What does it mean to be in the Father's house? For there are many false spirits that have gone out into the world. Test the spirits to see whether they are of God. There will be many who turn away from the path of righteousness... And therefore, there are many who are not in the Father's house. We cannot, as it says, uh, have fellowship with those. Well, let's let's uh, let's have a look at uh, first first John one three. Where is our fellowship? It's on it's on the front of that big trailer out the front there. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son. The fellowship, the joy, the experience of being in the Father's house is by believing in the Father and His Son. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things and we of Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by Him. That is the doorway into the house to believe that this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. Also, what does it mean to be in the Father's house? 2 Chronicles 20.20. 20. 2 Chronicles 20.20, 20. let's have a look there. The last half of the verse. Maybe even the last third. Believe in the Lord your God and what will happen. So shall you be established. Your foundation will be set up when you believe in the Lord your God. What is it to believe in the Lord your God? There is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ. In the acknowledgement and the worship of this God, you are established upon the foundation. And then it goes on. Believe what? His prophets. So shall you prosper. We don't only want to be established. We don't want to begin to build and not be able to finish. We want to prosper. And we need to believe His prophets. The prophets that have been sent unto us. And of course, the prophets are gathered together in this book and in the spirit of prophecy. If we want to prosper... In the Father's house, we need to believe His prophets. And of course, all of the prophets tell us, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come. So all the prophets are pointing towards that. And at the end of that particular uh, chapter and verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God And the faith of Jesus. I like to say, and I think Gary mentioned this, here here are they that keep the commandments of God by the faith of Jesus. By the faith of Jesus. And so, this is what I understand to be in the Father's house. To believe in our Father, God, His Son, the Lord Jesus. To believe His prophets and to keep His commandments. Within that, within that, I believe, there is room for brothers and sisters to come together. Now, what I find interesting is that if we think about a house where there are children, is every child's room identical? No, it's not. (laughs) Is every child's face identical? No. Each one of us has a different walk. Each one of us has a different 
journey in life uh, and there is going to be, when it comes to expressions of faith, expressions, I'm not talking about the faith, I'm talking about expressions of your faith, there will come about differences of expression and we deal with this all the time, differences of expression and uh, the question is, do the differences of expression, do they threaten us or do they enrich us? Well, as, as long as it's, remember, as long as it's within the Father's house, as long as it's in the Word of God, there can be expressions of worship that are not in the Word of God and I don't want any part of worship that is not in the Word of God. As long as it's in the Word of God and someone wants to express their worship for God according to that Word, then I, I want, what's the Word? I want the freedom to be able to, I want them to have the freedom to be allowed to express that without me feeling the need to necessarily do what they are doing. Does that make sense? Often when you get into a situation, there can be someone is engaging in a certain practice and then suddenly there's everyone else is feeling this pressure to perform or to, to do something in a certain way because of a, a small group of people or one individual that is very uh, charismatic or whatever, that is suddenly everyone is responding and doing exactly the same thing. That is not fellowship in liberty within the Father's house. That is compulsion. I, I want to believe that Within the Father's house, if we keep the law, the royal law, the law of liberty, that there can be differences of expression. But uh, no compulsion that is required. There is also differences in journeys, difference of experience. We are, all of us, on a journey being outside of the commonwealth of Israel, being born as aliens and for us as Gentiles, coming into a knowledge of the truth means a, a, a challenging journey for many of us. Uh, my journey, which many of you are probably familiar with, uh, led me to realize seven years ago that I actually was worshipping the wrong God. Now, that's a major, major transition. Of <laughs> um, and many who were worshipping the true God could look at me at that particular stage as worshipping a wrong understanding of God and say, this man is lost, this man is, he's worshipping a false God, there's no hope for this man. Well, praise the Lord, he kept leading me, he kept guiding me, he kept impressing me. And all of us, are on this journey. All of us are coming to, I hope, a deeper understanding of our Father's will for us in our lives. And not everyone is programmed on the same, that's not the word, not everyone responds to the path in exactly the same way, exactly at the same time. It takes time for different individuals to embrace different things and to make sure and to get it clear and sometimes there's things, questions that are not answered in our minds and it takes us time and I have observed that sometimes when this happens and some people move forward and other people wait, there is an alienation that begins to take place because some move on and the others don't move on and there's this pressure being applied both ways, either to say, well, you're, you know, you're moving off into some nonsense, some heretical teaching and the other person is saying to the one who's staying behind, well, you just don't have the courage or the faith to step out when God is telling you to step out and, you know, I thank God I'm not like you. It wouldn't be said like that necessarily, but I've, I've heard it said like that. So we're all in a, in a, we're all in a challenging situation and this situation is compounded by at least for us, our awareness of prophecy that, that the, the end of things is right upon us. It's, it's right upon us. And so there's this sense of urgency and there's this sense of, we need to, we need to get out there. 
And yet for many of us, we've been placed in a very difficult situation where the, the, for many of us, the, the family that we're connected to is deeply involved in an apostasy that is abhorrent to God and it's very difficult for us to work out, whoa, what do we do now? How do we deal with this? And this is taking some of us a bit of time to deal with this. And uh, as I was talking to one leader in the church recently who was appealing to me to come back to the church. And then when I said to him that, uh, unless you can show me in Scripture that Jesus is not the only begotten Son of God, I said, that's never going to happen. I'm in love with this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the begotten Son of the Father. And as much as I love you, I cannot forsake him uh, without clear evidence from Scripture. And the evidence is, well, it's been building for a long time now, so it's going to be a pretty hard job. But I, he said to me then, well, you need to move on. And I said to him, well, um, I was born in, in an Adventist hospital. I was raised in a Seventh-day Adventist school. I worked in an Adventist health institution. I served as an Adventist pastor. I was ordained as an Adventist pastor. I have thousands of friends within this communion. You'll have to forgive me if it takes me a little bit of time emotionally to adjust to that reality. That's, uh, so maybe I'm hanging on emotionally. It's taking me a little time. It's not a place I wanted to be, but that's the situation we're in. And so, coming back to the Father's house, how are we to abide in the Father's house? How are we to abide in the Father's house? There are many things that... And, and, and I'll step back. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. And if we are fellowshipping with the Father and the Son, then we should be in fellowship with one another. There should be a sense, as it says on the day of Pentecost, they were all in one accord, in one place. Heaven's reality of the Father's house manifested itself on the earth on the day of Pentecost. The invisible became visible. And it manifested itself. But there are challenges to that experience. And let me talk to you about some of the barriers that many of us experience in being able to come into the Father's house because of the walls of separation that exist for many of us. Walls between us. Let me... Uh, let me tell you a story about how this can happen in a person's life. When I moved from one location as a child to another location and I had to mix with a new group of, of children and uh, most of these kids, uh, I don't know what it was with a, living in a rural area, but most of these kids were like bean poles. I mean, they were really skinny people. And uh, I, I, I was a little bit more, uh, what's the word, rotund, or I, had a, I, had, a, had, a, had a little bit more weight on me than some of these uh, other kids. And uh, there was a television program on, and I, some of you will remember, uh, if, if, if you were watching television at that time, and uh, this is what they would, when I would come to school, this is what the kids would say to me. They'd say, hey, hey, hey. It's Fat Albert. <laughs> Some of you may remember that. And these kids would kept saying, they kept saying this to me, you know, to the point where I didn't want to go to school anymore. I didn't want to be taunted by these kids anymore. I was the new kid and they were going to let me know that I wasn't part of their group. And there was one morning where my mother went to drop me off in the car and I'd decided I'm not getting out of this car. 
Well, that made life difficult for my mother because I was kicking and screaming and, and I mean, it was, I was in pain because these kids had, had really, they'd done a good job on me. And uh, I was not getting out of that car. Uh, but eventually I was extracted and uh, with great noise and fanfare and the other kids had crushed me and they'd done their job. They were quite satisfied with themselves. And, uh, uh, but I did survive, but I was scarred by that experience. And uh, I know I'm not the only one that's had an experience like that. I know probably most people in this room have had experiences like that. And it made me vulnerable to feelings of rejection. It allowed Satan to begin to speak to me later on in my life when I would mix with people. These people aren't interested in you. You're a joke. What are you doing here? You should go home. You know, justify your existence. Why are you here? And these thoughts would get put in my head and because I'd experienced this trauma before where I had been told through these other children, you are not important, you are not valuable, you don't belong here, those scars could easily be reopened by other events, triggered. Satan could trigger me off and I could go back and, and even though as an adult the emotional trauma can trigger so that I'm still that boy hanging on to the seat of the car saying I'm not getting out of here. I can go back to that, well as I look back now and I've realized some of these things, I can be transported back there in a moment and feel those same feelings. I can feel those same feelings even when it's not a reality at all. Even when it's just in my head. You know what I'm talking about? Walls of separation. Experience of rejection. Makes us vulnerable to feeling rejected. And then there's other character flaws and weaknesses of the feelings of self-pity that you might be sitting there and Everyone seems to be talking and other people are conversing and you're just sitting there and no one's coming and talking to you and you know the verse that says, he that would have friends must show himself to be friendly. But people, you know, it's hard because I'm not an outgoing person and I, I, people should come up and talk to me and I've felt that plenty of times in the past. I've seen it many times. But these create walls of separation that make it hard to enter into this experience of dwelling in the Father and the Son, the, the feelings of being alone, of being separate. Uh, then there is the, the other reality is that for anyone who's honest with themselves, when they look at their lives, they know, well, you know, I'm just, I'm a hypocrite. You know, I'm, I'm showing up here and I'm, I'm reading my Bible and I'm singing, but when I'm alone, I'm tempted by things and I say things and I do things that I know are not right and I shouldn't do them. And, and so I don't, we can exclude ourselves by our own history and our own behavior that, that well, what am I doing here anyway? My life's a mess. Uh, no one really would like to talk to me anyway, so I, I don't really deserve to be here. And so, there are many walls of separation. There are m other walls. There are people in marital relationship where there are walls. There is pain, there is words that have been expressed, things that have been said, that have lodged in the heart, that stay there for many years and so there is walls, not only between brethren, but between within families. Satan constantly erecting these walls, getting people to express things, to lodge in the heart, build a wall, because I don't want to be hurt again. So I create a wall so that people can't hurt me. But when I create that wall, I can't enter into fellowship. I do remember having a discussion with my father once 
about transparency, about is it, is it a good thing to share and reveal what's in your heart? Because when you, when you open up and you share something that's really important to you and you lay it out on the table and you put it out there, there's a moment of vulnerability because if people go, oh, that's nice. Well, great, that's good. And you've put, you've, put, you've put your heart out there and it gets crushed. Well, you're not going to... You're going to think twice before you do that again. You're not going to... You're not going to... You think, hang on. Eh? And so you start sizing people up. You know, can I trust this person? Is this person safe? If I share something in my heart... And I remember saying to my... My father, with his life experience, that he, he felt it's not good to make yourself vulnerable. You make yourself vulnerable, you're going to get used. You're going to get abused and used. So don't make yourself vulnerable. The downside of, the, the downside of that, of course, is that you can't actually get close to people. In order to get close to people... You need to be vulnerable. But for many of us who've experienced a lot of hurt and pain in our lives, vulnerability is painful because it, vulnerability is an automatic trigger of your past. It's an automatic, whoa, I don't want to go there. You can get sweaty in the palms just thinking about it. You can get sweat on the brow just, whoa. But in, in my journey and what I have learned, particularly through some of the material, uh, Identity Wars and a Relational Value System, and uh, if you haven't had a chance to read the book, it's over there. Uh, I made a very conscious decision some years ago that I want to live my life in a, li in a state of transparency and vulnerability, because I know that's the only way that I can experience true connection and relationship with other people. I have to allow the risk of other people taking the things that are important to me and mean a lot to me and crushing them. But the Lord Jesus understands this process. He was a man despised and rejected. And the Bible says he is despised and rejected. He is a man wounded for our transgression. He understands the process of rejection, despised and rejected of men. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. He has overcome this process, and he has maintained his vulnerability, his transparency, his openness. He has maintained that so that we can enter into that. So that if you're feeling in that position, and I'm sure many of us t t today are feeling this, feeling this wall, feeling this aloneness, feeling this separation, Jesus Christ has overcome these things. And he can overcome these things in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory, to overcome the fear of transparency, to overcome the past experiences so that we can share what is on our heart regardless of the consequences. I don't think it's possible for humans beings to share what is on the, their heart without stopping doing that process without the Lord Jesus Christ operating in their lives. You're going to stop doing it at some point because you're going to get crushed by the assaults of Satan. And so, I want to invite each of us here to come to the Father's house. Allow the walls of separation to come down between husbands and wives, between parents and children, between brethren, between sisters, that we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ what I'm saying here requires a miracle of grace. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. And it's what we want, isn't it? 
We talked last October, Brother Igor shared about the safe place. We do need a safe place in order to open our hearts and begin to share. The safe place is Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus, there is a safe place in which we can share what is on our hearts. Share, and if Christ Jesus is in our hearts, what we share from our hearts is the heart of Christ. Now, there are times when in our human condition, we stumble and we fall and we say things that we regret. Uh, just recently, because of uh, my childhood experiences, and I shared with you one of the most uh, challenging ones for me personally, but, and I, I can say this, that, uh, you know, the whole Facebook experiment, I know many of you are, are uh, some of you probably not involved in Facebook, and that's probably a good thing. There are some benefits to it, but there's one thing about Facebook. is uh, I, f I find on Facebook there is, a, there is a continual mechanism in your voice, in your, in your mind going, huh, that person hasn't responded. Oh, they haven't included me in the group photo that they put up. Huh, oh, I've been left out here. Oh, they've ignored me here. Maybe I'm the only one that's a bit psychotic like that, but uh, <laughs> they don't care about me. <laughs> it's just, uh, well, life moves on and it wouldn't matter if I was dead, I'd just move on. So, uh, and these thoughts, Satan is constantly pushing these thoughts on us, you know, and it's like, no, that's rubbish, no, that's not true, and, and pushing it off, well, hopefully you're pushing it off and saying, no, you don't know that's true, you don't know that's correct, but I had a situation recently, forgive me for transparency, but this is the way I, I like to operate, where a brother, I wrote to him on email, got no response for a week, I sent him a message on Facebook, I saw the little tick where it said, seen, still no response, for four days, my head's going, what have I done? What have I said? Why, why is he shutting me out? And so I write to him and say, hey, you know, um, maybe you're busy, but, you know, silence like this is pretty harsh. <laughs> Two days later, oh, Adrian, I've been out of town, I've been away, oh. Satan's playing with my head, trying to get me, trying to put up walls, trying to create separation, you know? And I'm like, I said, I'm sorry, you know, childhood paranoia, <laughs> fat Albert, it's just still there, <laughs> still triggered. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to have, we, th these things Satan is constantly pushing on to us. I better, I better move on. So when we come, when we come to uh, discussing doctrinal differences, knowing, knowing this fabric of all the personal and interpersonal stuff that, that all of us are dealing with and we're dealing with doctrinal issues and, and someone shares something from the Word of God that they're deeply convicted about and don't tell me that when people share from the Word of God, they're not personally invested in what they're sharing. Well, you should be personally invested in what you're sharing if you're convicted about it. It's just that if someone doesn't see it the way that you see it, are you going to, you know, is it going to go, hey, 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 rejection kicks in, and then you get defensive, and they might be pointing out something that you hadn't considered but you're already in defense mode, you're already back at when you're six years of age, you're already way back there by the time that, and you're not hearing them anymore, you're just going, they've rejected me. We're well, not saying that, you're not, it's all, we, we, you've got to keep all this stuff down so that it, keep it suppressed so that it doesn't come out, you can't manifest this stuff, but it keeps leaking out in our speech, in our relationship with one another and, hmm,
I, uh, I had a miracle happen in the last camp, and I, I've asked... I've asked my brother David if I can if I can share this illustration where um, we had some doctrinal differences <laughs> and we had some fairly public stouches about this uh, in, in different ways and I I must say that um, I said some very harsh things to David and. Uh, and some of that was stemming from my childhood stuff. And I'm not going to blame, you know, you've got to get over that and stop blaming all that stuff. But, uh, and uh, I just found that when we came together last October and we came into the Father's house and the Father allowed us to recognize in each other that we both are in love with Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and it actually transformed our relationship in order that we could begin to listen to each other. And what I can say now is that uh, I have a deep love for my brother David, and I know he feels the same way about me. He is for me, and I am for him. Now, we don't necessarily agree on every last thing in the Scriptures, but we are both confident that we are going to come to a point. Our Father is going to bring us to that point. The Scripture tells us that we're going to come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. We believe this. And I believe this with many of you. We are going to come. C come up and share. Come up and share. <laughs> is this on? There's a verse in the Bible that says, Great peace have they that love his law, and nothing shall offend them. And um, that's a promise, and that's a promise that I've taken, and I believe in my heart. And so I know there was some things that went on between me and Adrian, and uh, there could have been an offense kind of defense kind of thing. And I just said, No, great peace have they that love his law, and nothing shall offend them. So no matter what Adrian believes, I believe that I can still have peace, and I don't have to set up a standard for Adrian. And I sent him a letter at one point, a letter about, it was about William Miller and Abraham and Isaac. And they had some misunderstandings. They had misunderstood, you know, who the seed was. For instance, Abraham said, you know, why can't Ishmael stand before you? And there was no condemnation. There was just a misunderstanding. And it was the same thing with Isaac. He said, you know, what about, what about Esau? You know, he wanted to bless Esau. And William Miller, he missed out on the Sabbath and Ellen White said that he's still going to be in heaven, you know, and that uh, there was that respect. And I said that to Adrian, and I said, you know what, I understand, and I believe that God is leading him. And uh, that was what I said to him, and through that, I believe that we've come a lot closer together. And even though I have differences, he's allowed it to be set aside, not be offended by some of the things that I believe. And we've come together, and so many of those differences have been sorted out and you know I just believe that God is leading us onto that mm. platform of truth and we're standing together and uh, it's it's what Jesus said the glory that I have I've given them that they might be one and uh, it's in the bond of love and that's that's the only way by his spirit we are made one Amen. yeah Amen. All right, brother. <laughs> love you. when he wrote to me and uh, he said how much he he appreciated me, and he he kind of he was kind of saying to me like, "Oh, you're a bit like William Miller," and I thought, "Well, that's a good thing, I think." <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to stay there. I want to keep growing. <laughs> yeah. So I, I I wanted to share that example of of a real situation of of overcoming. Uh, differences uh, uh, in the spirit. It's when you are personally invested in what you believe and what you believe, can, if, if someone challenges what you believe, becomes a challenge of you as a person, you cannot give up what you believe. It's not possible because if you give it up, then your value as a person goes down. And if our value is invested in what we believe 
then we're not going to be able to hear with an open mind. And this is what many of us are experiencing with many of our brethren, that when we share with them the Word of God, what we're saying is, the church is wrong. But that's not possible. The church cannot be wrong. How can all of these people be wrong? Who are you to stand against all these people? Well, I don't know. It's just what the Bible says. <laughs> I can't help that. Got a lot of people invested. A lot of people with invested a lot of money in their education and their PhD and their master's programs and their salaries and their sustentation. And I can't give that up. What, for this? Philippians chapter 2, we'll a bit of finish up. Philippians chapter 2, let's finish on this. Did you ever have that when you're younger and you're racing to get the Bible verse and you get there first and... <laughs> I'm still not there, so... <laughs> Old Kingdom, Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took on him the form of a servant, servant and was made in the likeness of men. He has exhausted the cup of rejection and degradation and woe in order that we may be able to endure the cup that we each must drink in this world. For if you are a follower of Christ in this world, you will experience persecution. You will experience challenges. You, Satan will be trying to put walls up all around you, all around us to keep us divided. But Christ has overcome the world. And so my, my challenge is as we... I, I've, I've got an... Uh, Gary's put together an audio-visual for a song that I, has meant a lot to me for a long time, and that is uh, in regard to the prodigal son. And the, my challenge to each of us is, are you going to come up to the Father's house? Are you going to allow the walls of separation to come down so that we can come into harmony, to talk together, to listen to each other, not having our value based on what we believe, but in who we believe, and that we will... Come into that one accord in one place. That song always gets me. I hope you'll take some time during this camp to turn your heart toward home. Let's just bow our heads and kneel if we can and pray. Father in heaven, Father at home. We thank you that we belong to the family of God. We have a history written in the Word of God. We are part of the family of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Believing in the one true God and the Lord Jesus Christ, believing His prophets and keeping His commandments by the faith of Jesus, we are in the Father's house. Help us to bring down the walls of separation, for if we are one with You, then we should be one with each other. Only You can make this happen because most of us here are pretty damaged by earlier experiences in life and many of us are over exposing ourselves to rejection again. We just don't feel we have the energy to do it. But we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you drank the cup, you experienced rejection to the uttermost, and you overcame those who rejected you. And that spirit can dwell within us so that we can regain our sense of openness and we can share out of your victory so that we can be open with one another. Father, there may be some some things here that we need to make right with others, for those around us. I pray that we would take the time during this camp to take active steps to bring down walls, things that have been said, things that have been uh, 
not said that ought to have been said. Please speak to our minds, speak to our hearts so that we will make restitution for the things that we have said and not said and that we will dwell together in unity in the Father's house. And I thank you, Father, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.